Thank you so much, guys, for helping us and surfing with our children. So today we're talking about, as we move into this time of service, about how we want to get prepared as an army to get ready for the fall. <laughs> Although if you look around you, look around you, the room is already full and the next room will be too. Listen, if everybody does what it is that God wants us to do with our talents and abilities, we all get better and we all have something to give to God's kingdom. Two of those people are Brian and Sarah Carnes, one of our elders who prayed for us earlier this morning and they're gonna come out now. We've got a couple stools that they're gonna sit on. Brian and Sarah were married last year. I know that for a fact because I was there and, and I, I performed the ceremony and signed the license. And we're so grateful to have these two people. Um, Brian first came to this part of the country as a missionary from the north to the south. And then Sarah came to join us. So tell, tell us kind of your story, Brian, and how you chose to get involved in, in here. Or first of all, tell us who you are and, and tell us about Sarah and how you guys came to the south. Yeah, my name is Brian and this is my wife, Sarah. Um, I moved down here from Ohio in uh, June of 2015. And uh, in the church up there, I had served in the kids' ministry. Um, there was a calling. They needed uh, people to help out. And uh, I was just sitting in the congregation, just like all of you. And my heart started pounding. <laughs> sitting there, and I go, okay, all right. I'll just still sit here for a second. And, and it kept pounding. I was like, okay, God, I'll, you know, I'll go talk to the, the, the minister. And uh, then I got connected in Kids Point, well, their kids' ministry there. It wasn't called Kids Point. Um, so then I moved down here, and I already knew what it meant to serve and the importance of being in a group life and um, doing what I was called to do, to serve. Absolutely. And Brian stood right back there at that exit. If you're going to the bathrooms and going out this exit um, in 2015, he started asking me about beliefs of the church and how to get involved. And within two or three weeks, he had dove right back into serving with kids. And so I'm grateful for your, your example and everything. Then he made the South even more pretty a couple of years ago when Sarah joined this, uh, the, below the Mason-Dixon line. Sarah, tell us about your kind of your story and how you got here. Yeah, definitely. Um, I moved from the New York area in 2020, right before COVID actually started. Good job. You beat yeah, it. I was ahead of the trend uh, and met Brian um, about, I don't know, years ago uh, and I was serving in my church in Charlotte in greeting I had always kind of felt called to greet um, and help welcome people with hospitality to the church uh, but with Brian when we started dating he was in Kids Point so I just followed him along and jumped in with the kids and really enjoyed teaching them about Jesus in a very basic level I think as adults sometimes we overcomplicate things but the kids need to learn things on a really basic level so um, it was really great to have that be the beginning of our relationship together serving in kids point cool so tell us kind of about what you do and how you how you're making steps and taking steps you actually were in the second third grade for a while right and now you're back in first yeah so I started out yeah teaching the kindergarten first grade class because that was combined at that time that time um, it's expanded back there like crazy. Uh, so they've split those grades. Uh, but then I moved to the second and third grade. Other things happened during COVID too. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that, I needed to get a little bit of break from the second and third grade boys. Um, if any of you have a boy, they, you know, they'll, they'll wear you down. That's right. So um, Sarah and I went to uh, start teaching the kindergartners and it's been amazing. Um, I have my own personality. Sarah has hers. So together as a unit uh, with the kids, I think we can do a phenomenal job to um, help out each kid that will one responds well to her. Another kid might respond better to me to, to listen. And, professional and engineer meets a professional marketer. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. Yep. The deal. So tell us about what it's like to serve as a team. And there might be people that are here. They're going like, man, I just, I'm intimidated by whatever it is that I, I'm being called to do. And the whole idea of your heart pounding and those kinds of things, this is a real thing where you're actually, there's a struggle that's going on with you about serving. And, and ultimately, you've got to be obedient to do that, or you can choose not to be and stay on the sidelines, but there are consequences to that. But you found that serving as a team together helps. Incidentally, it was not a slam dunk that they were going to make this their church. So we're grateful that after they got married, they decided, hey, we want to continue to serve at the point. So we're grateful for that. Tell us what it's like to serve as a team or maybe inspire some people to invite a friend or a family member to come and do it with them. Yeah, it's been amazing to serve together um, as a couple. I think 
I really look forward to every single week um, having us be able to just talk about it randomly throughout uh, the week in preparation for Sunday. Uh, and in Kids Point, uh, there is a lesson that you can follow. You're not off on your own. There's a lot of support um, with the curriculum that we have and then also the great um, leadership team back there. You're not alone. Uh, but even if you need some extra encouragement, inviting a friend or your significant other, it's a great way to just take that next step that you might need um, and kind of lean into that uncomfortableness. I, I think in the beginning I was a little unsure of doing some things a certain way when Brian had been teaching for so long, but um, you know, you, you find your way and you find the way that God is having you work through um, in that moment with that kid, and it's always going to look different. So you can just rest easy knowing that it's not you, it's, it's God. Sometimes it's, it's easier to do things together because you can bounce off of one another and draw from one another's strengths. Mm -hmm. So I want to challenge you to think about that. Any kind of closing words you'd want to share with us before we go? Yeah, um, I say one of the harder things uh, earlier on being uh, teaching with the kids is you don't see a lot of times the benefit um, you don't see the fruit of the work that you're putting into it. Um, and that's that's not true, uh, that there is benefit, of course. Um, I remember there was a kid who uh, came here for the very first time. It was only Sunday that I believe I ever saw him here. And second or third grade uh, boy. And uh, after the service, he had left the classroom, and then I was told by one of the other teachers what he had said. His mother asked him, said, hey, what did you learn back there? And the kid said that I've screwed up in life, I've sinned, and I need to repent from that. Wow. God is my creator and my savior. He got it. Um, he got it. And um, once you pick up on that with the kids, serving and kids specifically, is a lot of us have roles to just plant the seed. Others have a role to harvest. Or in your life, you could plant the seed, and then with someone else, you could be the harvester. Um, the most important is to just be obedient to God, what he's calling you to do in whatever talents that you have to find that role where he wants you to be and bring glory to God. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for sharing with us and being together with us as a team. It's an amazing, amazing kind of thing. So how do you get involved? Here's the deal. This is not just about getting involved to serve kids, to be very clear. We want you to get in that area. That's where God is calling you. But it's very easy to understand and to follow through in this process and learn more about it. You can use the QR code on your phone. You know how to do that. It's magical. It's such a cool kind of thing. There's also a place on the app and a process on the app by which you can follow through to say, I want to get involved in serving. First of all, you come to the next steps area down the front page. Click that. You'll go to this page. Hit serve, and then you move on. It says getting started, joining a volunteer team. Click it right up there. There's a little form for you to fill out. And then you see next some of the different categories of things that you can get involved in. And we need help in every area, and we are constantly expanding. And we are wanting all of God's people to deploy their gifts for his kingdom and for his good. So you consider doing this. Here's the other reason we're doing this early in the summer. We want you to have the opportunity to come and observe, to watch, to stick your toe into the water, to check some different things out. And we just invite you don't to, to not wait, but to dive in and say we want to be Part of our team here at the point. Just thank you so much to all of, that, of you that do serve, greeters, hosts, welcome, parking lot people, making sure your stuff is safe while you're in here serving. We're grateful for that. Now, today, if you're a guest with us, we want to thank you so much for joining us. If you're a guest, we want to know it, and here's a way that we can find out that you're here without standing up, having you stand up, or pat you on the back or anything like that. Use the QR code in front of you, or if you're sitting where there's uh, some on the floor in the front here and right in the middle, you can scan that QR, or actually scan that code and make sure to fill out the I'm new here. We want to send you a gift for being here. If you're watching online, we thank you for being with us as well. And we've got a gift that we want to send to you. It's a free $10 gift certificate to Chick-fil-A. We want to give you a meal this week. We are not going to knock on your door and give you a pie this afternoon, I promise. Um, although some of you might enjoy us doing that at some point too. Here's the other thing. We give to God as a step of worship. And um, COVID kind of changed a lot of that. We still don't, pat, we don't pass baskets like we used to, but there's a couple of ways to give. Giving honors God because we trust him with our first and our best. He promises to take care of the rest. Also, I would say this too. If we give God our least and our leftovers, why should we depend upon him for anything other than what he has left over? But more importantly, we had a, trip of, a team of people that went to Nicaragua this week to make a difference in multiple communities. They touched thousands of people. 
This week we have 17 students and adults that are going to Savannah to make a difference. And when you give, you make things like this possible. So we challenge you to do so. You can do it automatically by using the electronic options, or you can use the little envelopes in between your seats. If you're new to us, there are little envelopes and pins between the seat, and you can drop some in the, ba the basket, or rather not the basket, but the white box out in the lobby as you leave. All right, so here's the deal. It's 1018. We're supposed to be through by 1040. And here's the topic for today. Discuss the Trinity, give details, and be through by 1040. So let's watch a video from the Bible Project um, that I want to challenge you to watch. So that kind of gives you a good way to look at the dimensionality of the tr Trinity. So I've got a question that's always bothered me. The Bible says there's one God, but in other parts of the Bible, God is three, Father, Son, and Spirit. How can it be both? Yeah, this is a question that has mystified people for thousands of years. And while we can't fully explain it, I think we can better understand what it is that we can't fully understand. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, think of it this way. Here's a two-dimensional plane. And then here's an object with three dimensions that's going to pass through the 2D plane. Okay, right. From this perspective, the 3D objects above and below the plane. So now it makes sense, but imagine you were a 2D person stuck on the 2D plane. What would you see? I don't know. What would I see? Well, it would look like this. Oh, yeah, okay. From this perspective, it looks impossible. It's one object, and then, then two objects, and then three. But in reality, they're all one, just not in a way you're capable of understanding. Now, let's take this whole thing as a visual analogy for how we experience God. The claim in the Bible is that God is transcendent, a divine being through whom we live and move and have our being. Or, as God says, I am. Okay, but I live here in this universe, so when God appears, it will make sense in some ways, but in other ways, it will break my categories. Exactly. This happens all the time when people encounter the God of the Bible. So let's look first at how this happens in the Hebrew. There's a longer video that I challenge you to watch. As a matter of fact, if you're following along on the app in your notes, we've included a link. It's an eight-minute video. But essentially, this gets us started in the right kind of direction. Typically, God is described as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit in this kind of way. And, and the kids have asked the same question that adults are asking as well. How can God be one God, but there be three gods in one? As a matter of fact, too, part of Islam differs with Christianity in this, that they don't believe that Jesus is divine, that he believes he's one of the prophets, but that God is one and his name is Allah. We believe that God is three in one. So here's some ways that people have tried to conceptualize this and make it happen in their life. Some think of this as an egg, and an egg has a shell. It has the white of the egg and then the yolk in the middle, right? Some people, but, but that has dimensionality to it that doesn't make sense completely. Others use a clover. You know, there's three parts of the clover, and there's one clover, and there's at least three leaves. If you're very lucky, sometimes you find four, and they use the clover as an analogy as well. Still others will say that God is like um, liquid in that liquid can exist in terms of vapor, in terms of liquid itself or water, and then also in ice. But God is not modal. He's not one thing that ship shapes in the very, very different kinds of ways in his life and the way that he interacts as the Trinity. Um, perhaps the, the best way to think about this, and if, if you have children or students in your life that are trying to learn and understand this, the, the truth is most things we've learned by fifth or sixth or seventh grade are the things that we learn and stick with us for most of our life. We learn some other things along the way too. But think about it this way. I am Ray Hardy, which means at first I was Stan and Betty's son. But then along the way, God blessed me with a beautiful wife. And so to Andrea, I am her husband. But then God blessed us with three beautiful children, now grandchildren to follow that call me father. So in different relationships, I'm still the same person, but exist in that dimensionality as well. I think the very best way to determine this, and I think the Bible Project guys, incidentally, we support these people. We do not just use their stuff. We send them gifts throughout the year to make sure that we're supporting their ministry. If you don't understand some of the things of the Bible, go to the Bible Project video. Shout out to Tim Mackey and his cohorts and all those folks that are there. But, but is this. The Trinity should best be understood in terms of the way they described it. There's one that's being reflected in different kinds of ways and the way that we see it under the plane of eternity. I like to wait, think about it the way that D. James Kennedy, the former pastor from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, determined it. He said, we need to think of the Trinity as length 
and width and depth. One God in multiple dimensions. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Notice the Trinity scripturally from the very beginning. In the very first words of scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So, so notice the Trinity from the very beginning. We pop that scripture up on there in the beginning. And here's the next thing I want you to see too. Move to the next scripture. The spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. <laughs> Stop right there. Hold that for just a moment. In the very beginning, a lot of times people thought that the Spirit is something that shows up in the New Testament after Jesus comes and then Jesus leaves and then the Holy Spirit comes. The Spirit of God is present from the very beginning to the very end of time as we know it and time beyond what we know it. Before time, in the time we are in, and after time. Through all of, the, of eternity, the Trinity has been coexistent and preexistent. I know it's like, it blows my mind. How do we deal with this? But we also see a reference to Jesus in Genesis chapter one as well, in the very first chapter of the Bible. As the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit say, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's not God and the angels. It's not God and anyone else. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Very specifically, if you fast forward to Genesis chapter three, we see that Jesus is going to come as the seed of the woman to kill, ultimately, the plan of the evil one. Even though he is killed for a period of time, he rises again on the third day. So before we get through the first three chapters of the Bible, there's the presence of the preexistent Father, Son, and Spirit, and God as one. Here's the second thing. See the evidence of God's three and one nature in the way he created about himself and what he said about himself in those statements and about his creation of you. In Deuteronomy, in perhaps one of the most important chapters that every Orthodox Jewish person says at least once a day and multiple times a day, here's what God says about himself and about those people, a covenant people, the Jewish people at that time, but we're included in that number as well in Christ now. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is what? The Lord is what? And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might, all right? So even in the way that God has created us, it's a reflection back to the Trinity. Uh, point to your heart. I mean, sir, it's easy. That's where your physical heart is. I'll point to your soul. Where is that? P point to your strength. Where is that? Those three things exist, but they exist inside of you. So we begin to see in the paradox and the mystery of the Trinity reflected in the incredible creation that God has put into our very own bodies and our lives. So why do you point to your heart? Not just your physical heart. Where is that? Where's the, the heart that is the seat of our emotions and devotion? Where's our soul? Well, that's the totality of who we are, but it's not just our body, it's our, our mind and our heart and everything together as we've learned back earlier this year. So even in the way that God has created you and me, there's an indication of the Trinity inside of us based upon the different natures of our body. The next I want you to see, inclusion in God's family is in the name of all three members of the Trinity. Conclusively, before Jesus leaves this earth, as he's giving his, his last speech and some of his last words to people before he leaves the earth in the last part of Matthew, he gives us our mission. Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, and say it with me, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's so important that you and I understand this, that in the very end, Jesus is speaking about the three in oneness of God and that mission that has come to be fulfilled in him. And he says, now all authority belongs to me, not part of it, all of it. And any authority that we are given comes from him. But it stems from this relationship of these three who become one. These three who become one. These three who are one, who these three who are one. But I want you to notice now the nature of the Trinity, and we can tell from Hebrew scriptures based upon how God talks about himself as Father and Son and Spirit. Here's the thing I want you to see today. As we dive into this subject, 
there are two things that are very specific that are very baseline that I hope if you forget everything else we talk about today, you'll remember these things. There are two things about the Trinity as the members of the Trinity relate to one another in Scripture that are very specific. John Ortberg calls it the shyness of the Trinity, that there, there's not any fight for greatness among God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. Instead, there's this constant, oh, listen to that part of the Trinity. Oh, listen, we're going to show you what that means. And here's the second thing, and this is the most important thing of all. The Trinity lives in relationship, and they love each other. There's this loving relationship, this perfect loving relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. God has made us to be in relationship. That's why, hearkening back to that scripture we said earlier on, he said, let us make mankind in our own image. He said, well, where was Jesus in Genesis chapter one? I missed that part. I saw God, I saw the Spirit. Well, here's, we find out in Colossians chapter three in a letter that Paul writes to the church in Colossae, about Jesus. By him, meaning Jesus, all things are created, things in heaven and on earth. This is not in your notes. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him, Jesus, and for him, Jesus. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things hold together. It's absolutely... If your mind is not blown yet trying to figure this out, I would challenge you not to try to figure this out except for two things. There is a humility and the Trinity toward one another. And second, they love each other. Listen to the way that God elevated Jesus and Jesus elevated God the Father. And Jesus comes to fulfill his mission on earth. He comes as a baby. He grows into a young man. We see his appearance in the temple when he's 12 years old. There's been a trip to Egypt and back as they were running away from the powers of that be that were trying to kill Jesus. From the time he's 12 to the time he's 31, 32, 33, there's nothing said. But we can infer that he was part of the family business and that he took care of the family very likely. Joseph had died by this time, and um, Jesus has brothers and sisters. More about that later in another message, and we'll talk about that some more because a lot of people don't understand that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Not cousins, not aunts, not uncles, but brothers and sisters. More about that later. I want to dive into that, to that today. But when he ultimately comes out, Lacey and Miller family, thank you for the privilege of doing this with Lacey today. Because Jesus set the example by first being baptized. That's the way that he went public. He could have done it any way. There could have been drums. There could have been choirs. There could have been um, a big band or whatever. There could have been stuff come down from heaven. But ultimately, in a very humble kind of way, Jesus goes to demonstrate, not because he sinned, not because he needs to repent of anything, but as an example to us of what we are to do, that my old life is gone my new life has come. Jesus, for the all intents and purposes, his old life as the carpenter's son and the brothers of James and John and Judas and various other places, other people, was over. He went public. And when this happened, something fascinating happened. His cousin John baptized him in the Jordan River. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. So here's the presence of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then listen to this. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. All the Trinity's there. There's God the Father, there's the Spirit of God, and there is Jesus at the moment of Jesus' baptism when he goes public. And, and God elevates Jesus. Here's what it is. How many of you have your kids and they play new sports? They play soccer or baseball or they dance or twirl or gymnastics or whatever. So when your kids do great, what do you do? When they, when they kick the ball through the goal or they make the tackle or they, they, they get a hit or they, they make the out or they do the double back flip that we're going to see this summer in the Summer Olympics pretty soon on the ba balance beam. What do we do? That's my boy. That's my girl. That's what God is doing right here. God could have said, um, Jesus is important, but I'm really God. I'm more important. No, he's going, look at him. Look at what my son's doing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Then another event happens where 
Later on in Jesus' ministry, where Jesus and two of his disciples, one of them being Peter, go to the top of this mountain, and God decides to transfigure them, which means that they start glowing in the dark like uh, white angels or something like that. There's Moses, there's Elijah, there's Jesus. There's a representation of Moses as the Old Covenant, Elijah as the prophets in the last part of the Old Testament, and Jesus as the fulfillment of both the Old and the New Testament together in him. And that's why all these people are included. And here's what happens. In the middle of this amazing transcendent moment, let me ask you something. If I stood up here and Jonathan stood up here and Leilani stood up here, any three of us, and all of a sudden we start glowing in the dark like a Star Trek movie, right? You you guys would be impressed with that. Here's what Peter does. Hey, all right, here's what we need to do. We need to have a building program. We're going to stay up here on top of the mountain, and we're going to build a big building for Jesus. We're going to build a little building for Moses, and then uh, another little building about Moses' size for Elijah or whatever. In the middle of all that, God's going like, y'all are missing the point. Here's what he says. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to him. Man, if, if God could give every pastor in this land a message and this land and all lands around the world. Listen to him. Listen to him in scripture. Read the real deal. Understand the real thing. Come to worship together. Be part of God's family and God's mission. I hope you guys did not just hear Brian and Sarah go, this is why we serve. And you go, that's really wonderful. That's great. I'm going fishing. <laughs> or I'm going to go, I'm going shopping. Or I'm, I'm going to, no, no, God's called us to be part of his mission. And that's why I want to challenge you this summer to say, I want to be part of God's plan and purpose for this church and for this community because we alone are the hope of the world. So God elevated Jesus. And then Jesus elevated God the Father. God elevated Jesus. And now listen to what Jesus has to say. At other times in his ministry, these, the scripture comes to bear and he, he says a couple things about us, about him rather. So Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Because what the Father does, the Son also does. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you see me, you touch me, you're here, you're with me, but I'm just telling you what Daddy said. I'm just sharing with you what Daddy said. And I want you to understand that that I don't do anything except we see what Jesus is doing. He's going like, Daddy's more important. You see this elevation where God's lifting up his Son and then the Son is lifting up the Father, But it doesn't stop there. Then Jesus next explicitly says that he and the Father are one. How many? There are. They are how many? There are. When I was a new professional getting out of college, um, one of my first jobs was as a probation parole officer. I worked at Mech 1 prison unit. used to be called Camp Green right off of Billy Graham and Tavola. It's not there anymore. It's another Amazon warehouse or something. Um, But I would go into the gate every day as a 23-year-old and unlock the gate and work with prisoners all day that are about to be released. But the superintendent, or the commandant, if you will, of the prison camp who ran the whole thing was a man named Captain Reese. And Captain Reese was Jehovah's Witness. And so we would have discussions. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that there is a trinity. They believe there's only Jehovah, there's God, and then there is Jesus. And he's he's important, but he's not as one as God. But here's what Jesus said. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Say it with me, this next sentence. I and the Father are one. Captain Reese would say, no, they're one in purpose. I went, wait a minute. I don't see that in my Bible. He said, what's in mine? That's why you guys have got to learn and pay attention and to get a copy of a good translation, the English Standard Version, the New Living Translation, or the NIV, or the New King James, because there's lots of translations where stuff is written in that wasn't there in the beginning. There is no indication in the earliest manuscripts that what Captain Reese said, that means they are one in purpose. There's no in purpose in there. I and the Father are one, says Jesus. And then finally today, Jesus elevates the Spirit, and then Jesus speaks of how the Spirit will elevate Jesus. Know the real deal, folks. Handle God's truth. Spend more time reading Scripture than you do watching the news. But as a matter of fact, in the news, there's a few facts, and there's a bunch of spin. In Scripture, it's all facts, and it's God's way and truth and life for us to follow. When I went up to Truist Bank earlier this week to 
buy a gift card for a friend of mine who helped us in ministry. Um, I saw them pull out a big plastic bag full of $100 bills, and they're all stacked up. I was like, man, what it must be like to walk around with $100,000 in your hand or whatever. Do you know how bank tellers learn what is real versus what is not real? They handle it. They touch it. They examine it. They see it. And I hope, and you will continue to worship with us. And there's great reasons to come to worship with us, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person. But here's the deal. You've got to learn to handle the truth for yourself because your faith is going to be challenged. And finally, how does the Son, Jesus, elevate the Spirit? He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. They wanted to cling to him. They wanted to hang on to him. For if I do not go away, then the helper, the helper is another name for the Holy Spirit. It's the word in Greek, paraclete or parakletos, which means someone called alongside to help you. The helper will not come to you if I don't go away. But if I go, I'll send him to you. So Jesus is sending the Spirit. You see this? And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So as you are immersing yourself in connecting and understanding God's word, and then God takes it and translates it in your life and the decisions and the things that you have to do and to make on a day-to-day basis, then ultimately the spirit is the one who now comes to live inside of you when you say yes to Jesus and when you choose to follow him to guide you into all truth. I think that you should ask the spirit not only what translation to use, but you should ask, should I buy this car or that car? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I have a child or not have a child? Should I do this or do that? Should I eat this or eat that? The Spirit will guide you into all truth. But he continues. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here's what he's saying about the Spirit. The Spirit's going to remind you of what I said when I was on the earth. Do you see how this beautiful mashup, this magnificent mystery works? The the Father's elevating the Son. The Son is elevating the Father. The Spirit is elevating the Father and the Son. And over and over, this dynamic takes place over and over through Scripture as they in relationship together humble toward one another. There's no importance battle between God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's not like, well, I'm really God, I'm more important. No, I'm the Son, I'm the most important. I died after all. I'm the Spirit, no, I'm more important. I'm the one that came after. No, they work together. Just as God wants us to work together. But most of all, I want you to see this and see this very clearly. They love each other. So what today, the three are one. Three are one in essence and purpose. So there's a step that we all need to take now, though, and many of you have taken it. Now what? While we cannot fully understand, we can fully embrace and follow the one God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. If you say, but I still don't understand and it bothers me, then maybe you're trying to be God instead of following and serving God in all of his perfection. Surrender that. Learn from the humility and the love God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit toward one another. Would you bow your heads and hearts in prayer? Today, before we leave this today, before we click off, if you're watching online from the beach or the mountains or the desert or the seas or wherever you happen to be, I want to challenge you to be assured of one thing before you leave this place. And many, perhaps even most, here have made that decision. But today, if you have never made the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the master of your life. I want to challenge you today to do that by simply praying this prayer. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Dear Jesus, dear Heavenly Father, dear Holy Spirit, dear three in one, 
I give you my life because I know that you have the answers, you have the guidance, you have the direction. Make it simple. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Dear God the Father, I give you my life. Dear 